So I was asked to uh, speak on some observations of what may be on the horizon and provide a few insights uh, for the future or the near future for focal therapy. And I wanted to focus the observations on four main areas, patient selection, technology and technique, follow-up, and then long-term outcomes. Now, of course, there's contention with each of these categories. However, uh, the ICUD, uh, International uh, Consensus for Urologic Disease in 2015, put together several panels to try to reach consensus on these issues. So in the absence of data and long-term clinical trials, we have to look towards consensus uh, in an attempt to drive the field forward. So let's look at patient selection first, step by step. <clears throat> On the top row here uh, are four different consensus uh, groups that met 2010, 2012, 2015, 2016, and let's see how things evolved. So the first one is, um, is the goal. Uh, 2010, eradicate all the cancer. So now in 2016, we're just going after the clinically significant cancer. How do we determine cancer? Back then, mapping biopsy. Now, MRI and systematic biopsy. What about MPMRI? Back then, only at centers of excellence. Now, use whenever possible. How about biopsy of suspicious lesions? 2017, yes. Biopsy of non-suspicious lesions? Yes, at least 12 cores. Disease factors. Back in 2010, we were treating, for the most part, low risk and some low intermediate risk disease. Now we've pushed that into the intermediate risk with, I think, four plus three as being one of the higher grade cancers that someone would tackle. Um, there wasn't really any guidance on maximum size. Again, most were doing hemiblation back then, so as long as you're bleeding the one, one half of the prostate didn't matter. But now, since we can see these lesions and measure the volume, we do have some guidance of lesion size. And then residual disease, back in 2010, we didn't really tolerate any residual disease, but now we're much more comfortable with active surveillance, and we think it's okay to, to watch some Gleason 6, maybe even a couple millimeters of Gleason 7 in select cases. Now, life expectancy, we're following the major guidelines, and sexual function, we think it's important to preserve that, but that's not really the only reason for doing focal therapy. Now, some of the pitfalls uh, that we have today regarding patient selection is the 12-core biopsy that used to be used to detect unilateral disease for hemiablation. The problem was the specificity was 34 percent. This then progressed to the transperineal template mapping biopsy, has a great detection rate, it is invasive, and you need an operating room for the most part. So today, this is all progressing again to the MRI and the fusion biopsy, but it's reader dependent. Uh, fusion has many moving parts. Uh, it has a high negative predictive value, but um, I think most people feel that you still need some systematic biopsies in addition. Now, this is a study that we did at Duke, and uh, I know Scott Egner made a few comments uh, this morning about extra capsule extension. So the purpose of this study was to look at extra capsule extension for uh, preoperative planning, whether it be nerve sparing surgery or focal, whatever you're going to do with that. And this shows ROC curves. Um, and <clears throat> the first one down here looks at just clinical um, tables, like the part and tables for prediction. And then what we did is we added on top of that, we layered on top of it, standard multiparametric MRI, standard read by a radiologist. They gave a little bit of a modest improvement but we found when we have a really experienced reader who, who really um, looks for these things, looks at these with, with interest, uh, we push the ROC curve above 0.91%. Uh, fusion biopsy, again, is dependent on many moving parts, quality of the reader, the fusion process, and also some patient factors. And this just gives you an idea of using the Euronav what needs to happen. So you can see the, the outline in magenta of the, uh, the MRI with the lesion. The, but the first step is to keep moving this around. So first step is we have to push this up, they have to push it down distally, and then, you know, there's too much pressure with the, with the probe on the rectum. You can see it's being tented up here. So you have to drop the pressure off of this, and then finally 
it's not angled properly. So then we have to put a little angle into this to really fit this on. But, you know, th there's a lot of moving parts to this, and I think sometimes people get frustrated because they're not hitting the lesion, mm -hmm. and that that's, has to do with the process. But we have newer imaging modalities. The fusion process itself is fraught with many challenges, as many of you know. Not all lesions detected by MRI are cancers, but we're in, in need of better imaging modalities. Who wouldn't want antibodies directed to uh, the prostate cancer target? And here's one right here, uh, gallium-68. It's uh, been shown to have increased specificity when linked to PSMA and combined with multi-parametric MRI. Uh, these newer imaging agents will lead to substantial improvements to image-directed diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. And then, uh, as many of you know as well, urologists are very versatile with using uh, real-time ultrasound, so it'd be nice if we could give that back to the urologist and devise what's called multi-parametric ultrasound. We've, none of us have been working on this for some time. This would save substantial time, it would obviate the fusion process, and I think be much nicer. So this is a, um, a schematic that shows an example of PSMA PET MRI fusion in action. You can see here the top left, there is a uh, dark area in the anterior fibromuscular stroma. There's increased vascularity in the middle one. Then you can see the very brisk wash in, wash out curves. Um, you can see here in diffusion weighted, it's very restricted. Uh, then we do our, our PET image. You can see your target. We fuse it with the multi-parametric MRI. I mean, that's beautiful. And I think that's where it's headed, uh, at least for, for fusion, okay? Hybrid PET MRI scanners has enabled functional and molecular info to be combined. And the G, the gallium-68 PSMA PET uh, signal combines with spatial resolution of MPMRI to create uh, nice fusion biopsy platforms. Uh, here's an example of a, a small study by Stortz looking at histologically confirmed prostate cancers from seven uh, suspicious cases, and they found uh, cancer in six of them. And then in a separate study, uh, Roe et al. looked at a different agent. Uh, this is a different tracer, 18F DCFBC, CT PET combined with MRI fusion. So this gets a little more complicated, but they reported sensitivity that was decreased compared to MPMRI, but the specificity improved for higher grade disease. And these are just two examples of newer types of molecular agents that are soon to be incorporated with imaging and fusion biopsy. The other approach is to not use fusion. And this is one of the uh, items that we're working on in terms of multi-parametric ultrasound. This is called ARFI, Acoustic Radiation Force Impulse Imaging, very similar to elastography, looks for tissue stiffness changes. You can see the, the lesion here in the ARFI mode. Uh, you can't really see it in standard B mode. And then you have the whole mount corroboration right here. Um, but I think that this is a way of doing it real time in the clinic with ultrasound. You can have a wand with several different buttons you can, you can hit. You can put maybe a flow on top of it. You can use ARFI to interrogate stiffness and there's no fusion process, so you won't have that as, as a potential pitfall. This is a study that we did. We compared to whole mount uh, radical prostatectomy specimens. Each patient underwent ARFI and then underwent multi-parametric MRI. And you can see here, so for patients that had a high PIRAD score of a five, ARFI's quite good for big lesions, 100% detected, nine of nine. MPMRI, 87%. PIRAD's four, ARFI found 85% of the larger lesions, MPMRI 56. So for both these modalities, as the index of suspicion drops or the size decreases, this, this uh, uh, also drops off. Focal ablation technology, there's been a number of them. Cryo, there's eight cohort studies reported. Steve Jones talked about the cold registry this morning. HIFU, four cohort studies, laser, phase one and two. You heard about phase three from VTP uh, this morning. Uh, IRE, phase one and two. And then there's other ones. There's new ones coming up uh, almost every day. Brachy, SBRT, gold nanoparticles, et cetera. The field is moving towards more focused treatments. Here's four schematics of focal therapy. However, as you all know, uh, cancer is a cellular disease. 
and there are studies now that MPMRI cannot reliably determine the actual boundaries of the tumors. We talked about that earlier. And it cannot detect some of the smaller lesions. Um, so uh, for really targeted ablation, like the top left, and this is how the laser uh, therapists treat, um, they're having some issues with incomplete ablation rates because the treatment area is too tight. Most focal therapists now, they've kind of migrated from hemiablation, and they're doing some kind of a form of a, a quadrant ablation at this point in time. Uh, in the absence of comparative trials, we looked at outcomes between preoperative potent men treated with focal versus whole gland cryotherapy. This is a matched population based upon the COLD database that Steve Jones talked about this morning. Now, this one is 634 men. These are all low-risk patients. The bottom line is there was comparable oncologic control between focal and whole gland treatment. Uh, but the patients who underwent focal had higher erectile function preservation at 24 months. Now with cryo, the continence, the retention rate, and the fistula rate made no difference whether it was focal uh, or whole gland. Uh, we take, took the same uh, uh, scheme and then used an intermediate risk uh, match pair analysis. This is 200 men, and, and when comparing partial to whole, Biochemical progression-free survival was not significantly inferior uh, for, um, for partial gland ablation, but the sexual function was nearly doubled. I think this is one of the new uh, treatment options that we have going forward for focal therapy. Due to the ability of MRI to see anterior lesions, we now have what's called anterior ablation. This shows cryotherapy probes. There's four of them placed here through a grid. You can see the placement of the probes here on ultrasound. The schematic is down here, and you can see our ice edges right here. Now, we're ablating this whole top part. Nowhere is this ice coming anywhere near the neurovascular bundle. So I think this is an ideal form of focal therapy going forward if we can recognize it due to the benefits of multiparametric MRI. I want to make a few uh, comments on uh, treatment adjuvants, everyone's looking for the holy grail to find an adjuvant that improves the efficacy of ablation and perhaps minimizes the effect on the neurovascular bundles. There's a number of categories, as you see here, of potential sensitizers. Now, for an example, adjuvants can take the form of a thermophysical one, such as altering the cell microenvironment, seen with ice crystal formation. Um, or uh, you can combine different agents. These are, these are two different ways of killing st uh, strategies, such as chemotherapy and cryoablation. These are uh, four curves here, cryo alone, chemo alone, combination therapy. And the bottom line is the combination of cryo followed by chemo, which is shown in the lower curve, is the most efficacious. Now, what's interesting, the chemo is given two weeks after the cryo because they've done some basic science studies showing that VEGF tends to peak at that point. You have increased microvessel density and oxygen in the tissues, and that's probably the best time to give your chemotherapy. Particularly useful are agents that function in the apoptotic zone. These are agents that can help push the cells into the death pathway. It is at the edge of the ablative therapy that cells are most at risk to recover and uh, can have cancer persistence. So you see here you have TRAIL and TNF-alpha. Nutraceuticals. Vitamin D has been shown to be a cryosensitizer. Uh, you have here Ellen cap cells, androgen sensitive. Over here on the right, androgen insensitive. Here's your control group. This is vitamin D alone, kind of a slow fall off. Here's your cryo alone. And then finally the combination. You don't see any repopulation. So two interesting things. So that worked equally well in the androgen insensitive cell line. And typically, it's harder to kill with cryotherapy um, and salvage men who uh, failed radiation because you get more androgen independent uh, cancers. And second, the temperatures that we're, we're needing to kill are much warmer. This is minus 15. Most of the time for cryo, you have to get down to minus 40. So we've changed the temperature uh, for cell kill. Uh, switching gears to follow-up, there are several unaddressed issues that need to be discussed. 
Um, have we attained sufficient quality in imaging to emit systemic biopsies at follow-up? I would say no. What is the necessary frequency and follow-up schedule for MRI, fusion biopsy, systematic biopsy? What's the role of PSA? Uh, we've talked about definitions of failure and treated in the untreated zone. And regarding markers, we have a long way to go. Clinical trials are needed. PSA alone doesn't seem to be the magic bullet. We've spoken about uh, MRI um, and biopsy already. And uh, just a point about retreatment, if you're thinking about doing it with focal, the cause of cancer persistence or recurrence in the treated zone can be multifactorial, but before you consider uh, salvaging with more focal therapy, you have to make sure you can identify the reasons for the initial failure and then correct them. Long-term outcomes. Slide still loading. There are none. We need them. Um, we need randomized trials. We need multifocal focal therapy registers that are done in a standardized manner. So there's a lot that needs to be done going forward. Thank you for your attention.